Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, thanks for either um, staying up late or um, getting up early uh, for joining this talk. And thanks for the introduction. Um, as said, this talk will be about um, our use case of Airflow here at DXC for autonomous driving um, using at high scales. And um, I will give this talk with my colleague Anton. Um, and uh, we want to start off first with introducing ourselves. So um, to myself, my name is Philip Lang. I work at the XCSA uh, Solution Architect, and my role is to uh, lead a team of uh, developers to drive the development um, around Airflow in our project. Um, I'm very happy to, to have this team. They are very talented developers. And um, yeah, I'm working for, uh, for the XC now for more than two years. And before, um, I was actually working in science and astrophysics and working with a lot of uh, astronomical data with data processing, automated data pipelines. Um, and yeah, that's about myself. Um, Tony, over to you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anton Ivanov, and um, I'm a DevOps engineer at uh, DXC Technology. Um, I'm a member of the Air Force team uh, for about uh, two years already. And they have more than 10 years in the, in the IT world. Um, most of them, uh, as a sysadmin and, uh, and they hope uh, you will enjoy, enjoy, uh, our presentation. Philip. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, I take over from here. Um, good. So let's start with, um, basically saying, um, introducing DXC, who we are. So we are a large IT end to end solution provider. We um, help to accelerate solutions for our customers across various industries. We operate worldwide in over 70 um, countries, and we um, have over 100,000 talented employees to drive the solution for our customers. And um, one of um, our successful and um, also exciting domains is the um, autonomous driving industry, and that's um, what this talk is, is about. So um, let's go um, to an introduction about autonomous driving and what it has to do with uh, data-driven development. And uh, I want to start off with showing you that um, the different levels of autonomous driving, you have probably seen that already quite a couple of times, but let me again quickly um, go over this. So basically in the, in the yeah, challenging and ambitious, ambitious pursuit to develop fully autonomous cars, um, that drive without any driver, um, um, the industry has developed certain levels which represent um, kind of intermediate goals, intermediate milestones um, that go basically from and transferring the responsibility from the driver, from the human driver to, yeah, to, a, to a machine that makes the decisions. And this goes from level zero where you have basically a classical car steered by, um, controlled by the human, to a fully autonomous car that doesn't even need a driver anymore. And these levels are, um, um, these intermediate levels are level one, where you have, um, where you can basically take the feet of, of, of the pedals. It's um, kind of a cruise control. And um, this is something that you might already use on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you have um, level two um, with a higher level of automation where you can, in certain situations, also take the hands of the steering wheel and an example here would be um, something like uh, um, automated parking control of the car. This is um, also something that you, you might already use. And then um, level three is something that um, has um, a very high level of automation already. So this is something that um, uh, will, for example, be used on, on the highway where the car um, really makes their own decisions, where you can also take, uh, take the eyes off, you don't need um, um, to, to, to basically steer um, the car and make directions. However, you, you still need to interfere when the car is basically not capable of making decisions anymore. And um, this level three of autonomous driving is really the, the frontier of, of, of where a lot of um, research and development is putting in into the industry. And um, yeah, besides the, the, the classical, the, the, the electronic and mechanical engineering, that goes into this, there is a lot of um, yeah, uh, work on the software research and development on the artificial intelligence and machine learning part 
that needs to be um, yeah that needs to be developed and needs to be leveraged in order to get the car on the streets. And that is exactly the yeah the domain uh, we are and the frontier we are working with. And in order to to accelerate this uh, research and development to put out uh, level free um, autonomous cars uh, on the streets, and BXC is offering a um, like an ecosystem um, to to drive this development or that to to make to enable our customers to drive this development and uh, we call this robotic drive it's basically an ecosystem that includes a lot of different uh, processes and pipelines to basically go from the from the data that you see on the left to the to the automated cars that you see on the right and such an ecosystem um, includes a lot of different pipelines a lot of different processes um, so it's really a complex chain and i won't go all the detail into this just to mention that this um, includes, for example, that um, the test cars collect data using their sensors. They ingest the data into, into um, a platform which stores the data. And then um, there, there are automated pipelines that kick in to, to basically treat the data, to process the data, um, uh, to analyze the data. So um, taking, for example, um, analyzing the quality of the data, the geographical positions of the car, um, to label the data, to um, compute, to train models, and then also to, to simulate the behavior of the car given the data. And this is all a, a feedback loop where there is a sort of convergence to optimal models, to the optimal solutions um, based on KPIs that you calculate. And then um, this is really needed to converge on the, on the final solution. Then this, uh, then where this would be ready to get verified in the end by the authorities so that's the final solution uh, so that the final cars can go out of the street and um what uh, and this is where basically um airflow comes in here and um, for our project we basically have built for one of our customers a an hpc platform um, that is built on this ecosystem that um basically um orchestrates uh, that gives the computational infrastructure and orchestrates all these different pipelines and this is, for example, and this is basically the use case for for Airflow that we use. So we use Airflow for, a, as I said, for a large HPC platform um, uh, where a lot of uh, development is going on. It's a multi-tenant platform, and we actively choose um, Airflow as an orchestration engine here to um, yeah to orchestrate all these different pipelines that I just showed you. And we uh, yeah actively choose Airflow because it's a really um, amazing state-of-the-art piece of software that is open source. It's very scalable, which is very important for our for our use case. It is built on Python with a shared uh, code so that it's customizable. And, and also there's a very active community and that does a really an amazing work on keeping Airflow maintained and keeping it improved uh, constantly. And uh, before we go into yeah, the nitty gritty of, um, of our Airflow startup, let me first um, basically iterate on what are the exact uh, requirements uh, that we have um, for an orchestration engine. And uh, first and foremost, this is scalability. And for our case, for our use case, it's very important to, um, to have vertical scalability of a given Airflow instance, because we basically have a, um, a DAG or a group of, a small group of DAGs that are triggered um, very often, that are basically triggered at once thousands or even ten thousands of times and this kind of uh, yeah this batch of jobs need, needs them to finish in a reasonable amount of time so what this what does this mean is that um, airflow needs to process as many tasks as possible at the same time and this is what we yeah our basic requirement on scalability that we have need a single airflow instance to be vertically scaled as max uh, as much as possible also airflow needs the yeah endurance and and stamina to process a lot of jobs um, yeah, on, a, on a longer time scale. So we have over half a million jobs that we process per month. Um, and jobs, I mean, DAG runs that, that are triggered per month. We have a different, uh, uh, like a manifold set of um, orchestration workloads that are started from Airflow and which are then um, um, running on the platform. It's uh, a significant part of Spark jobs that are submitted from Airflow uh, to our data cluster. We have um, the uh, Kubernetes pods that are running on our cluster also started uh, from Airflow uh, using the Kubernetes pod operator. And um, uh, last but not least, 
we we have not a, a single deck or a single decks running by itself it's really that we have um different decks that basically depend on each other we have uh, orchestration decks that trigger child decks across different airflow instances that do uh different kind of jobs all at the same time so it's really a, a complex uh, complex thing a complex pipeline that all runs together thousands of times that need to be that need to be orchestrated um, we need the flexibility to basically customize the code um, to inject some some um, yeah, changes in the code base and configurations we have different airflow instances running on the cluster which all need some sort of different um, configuration based on the on the DAX um, they are they are hosting um, it's, uh, I think, self-understood that we need some stability on the platform and we need fault tolerance against um, failures of containers that are running on our Kubernetes cluster that host airflow. Um, so we need high availability in essence. We're also um, doing regular updates of airflow and, um, and we need really um, a, like minimal business impact, um, impact on running jobs when airflow is updated, for example. And um, yeah, last but not least, uh, it's security is also a big a big point for us. Um, we're dealing with a multi-tenant platform where hundreds of users um, basically act and uh, basically log into airflow, start jobs. And this means that we need uh, yeah, a thoroughly designed and very sturdy layer of authentication authorization for airflow for our platform to to deal with this uh, multi-tenancy and yeah basically these requirements have have uh, driven um the development of airflow and our custom um uh, yeah um our customizations and this is something that for all of these points we will more deep dive in the remainder of the talk and i want to start with um basically showing you uh here yeah, a timeline um, to really show you the how which journey um we we yeah we we did when uh, when leveraging airflow when when scaling up airflow for our use case and we start with the poc back in 2019 um where we um had the first setup of airflow this is the the, the properties and the, the the yeah the the main setup the main components of effort we used back in the days so we started off with a version of airflow one we um used the salary executor since we thought that this is um yeah mostly scalable and um and uh, adequate for our use case we used a couple of tens of, of tasks that can run at, at at once in airflow we used the postgres as a main database and also as a salary database um, we use a rabbitmq as a message broker um, using basically a single instance of rabbitmq and a single queue in airflow and then finally we constructed some auto um, deployment automation that was based on ansible and really um now the state of the art that we use uh, for airflow now um i want to show you that in, in comparison here to basically show you the, the journey that we've got through and it was quite a journey so we basically now using a, still a version of airflow 1 1 10 10 this is basically a particular version of airflow that we are, that we are happy with and we made some custom adaptions here and there for our use case in the code base. But in essence, it's uh, yeah, Airflow 11010. We used to max out the really max out the salary executor so that Airflow can process 10,000 tasks at a time concurrently. This is something that yeah, we 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 really achieved by uh, uh, modifying all the components that you see here. This is something that for now suffices our our use case. Um, yeah. And uh, for Postgres, we also made a lot of adaptions. Uh, we used to introduce PG Bouncer, we used uh, Crunchy. We are about to implement the Crunchy Postgres database, so highly available uh, database. We also uh, did a lot of on RabbitMQ. We have an HA RabbitMQ serving over 50 Airflow queues for a given instance. And also uh, we modified the automation quite a bit. We are now using Helm charts that are able to basically update any part of Airflow um without interrupting any jobs uh, so to have like basically no business impact since uh, this is what we call rolling updates and we'll talk for all, about all these things we'll talk later in the talk and, and give more deep dives and a little bit more of our setup so we have deployed airflow on OpenShift, which uses then kubernetes as an orchestration um sorry as a containerizing engine we use helm charts as i said before um, we use the salary executor um, where basically each salary node is a, a separate container running on OpenShift. We use um, several Airflow instances that are running on OpenShift. 
that are um, yeah, all these heavily scaled up instances, plus we have some ad hoc uh, to be deployed instances for development purposes, so like more lightweight instances. We use the Kubernetes operator very heavily, and we even customize it a little bit. And since a significant part of the jobs that are started from Airflow are Kubernetes pods. Um, also, we integrated Airflow with MapR. Uh, this is the MapR is the data storage on, on our platform, where, um, for example, for Airflow relevant, the, DAG, the DAGs and some configuration are stored. But it's also very important uh, to mention because, um, yeah, the a significant part of the job started from Airflow are um, Spark jobs that are submitted to our, to our data cluster to Yarn. And um, yeah, this is um, an important connection that we also worked with a lot and we customized the Spark submits operate in Airflow also quite significantly. Also to mention is that we um, use a quite extensive logging and monitoring framework. We um, basically collect metrics from Airflow and important to Prometheus where we, um, and also to Grafana where we can surveil Airflow and monitor Airflow. We have an extensive uh, alerting framework that will notify us in case there are any, 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 any issues appearing with Airflow. And um, we also look on, uh, collect logs from Airflow, the Airflow task logs using Elasticsearch and they export them to Kibana where they can be queried. Also, we, we reworked quite a bit the, the logger in Airflow, the logging class um, to, for the logs to be optimized. This is something that we'll also talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, later during the talk. And last but not least, again, security topic um, is important. So we optimize the authentication and authorization layer. Uh, it's integrated in our platform with LDAP but also with a centralized IAM solution, identity and access management to be able to, to really um, yeah, improve the authorization authentication and to basically enable token-based authentication for the web interface and for also for Airflow's REST uh, API. So that was the, um, uh, our setup in a, very, in, in a nutshell, very quick. And we now want to go uh, more into a deep dives of the different developments for different parts of Airflow. And um, I want to start the section with uh, mentioning the Spark Submit operator, since this is the yeah basically the, the piece of code that we that we adapted quite a bit, and um, basically our use case for the Spark Submit operator is as I said um, a large portion of work that is orchestrated um, our platform our Spark jobs that are submitted from Airflow into the data cluster um, using the cluster mode. So you will provide your own um, Spark driver in the Airflow containers. It's um, we faced a couple of challenges when scaling up and when starting a significant number of Spark jobs, and that is that um, it is very difficult in the con um, in the default Airflow configuration to basically correlate jobs in Yarn with um, with that that are failed with with DAX that are failed, and so it's it's it, this is a matter of uh, basically of logging. And then also, um, we, when, when we scaled up Airflow and we started a lot of different Spark jobs in a given Airflow container, we, we, we noted that the jobs very often get stuck and do not progress anymore. So the connection between Airflow and our data cluster um, um, was, not, was not set up in an optimal way. And um, to basically um, overcome these difficulties, we reworked a bit the Spark submit operator. We improved the logging part where and now the, the Spark submit token is basically able to um, retrieve some information about, about the Spark jobs from Yarn, for example, the job ID or the job status. Also, it is able to um, basically port the, um, uh, the actual applications log, application logs of the Spark submit uh, process into Airflow as Airflow task logs. And this has proven very, um, very useful to be really troubleshoot the failed Spark jobs on, on that the, the failed on Airflow. And um, also we improved the, yeah, the, the scalability, scalability and stability of the Spark Summit operator. As I said, we solved this issue on, on Spark, Spark jobs uh, when, when scaling up. Um, this was actually a big issue and we, uh, this required some rework of the Spark Summit operator that um, yeah, the process how, um, how Airflow is submitting the Spark jobs on an operating system level. And also we, re, we reworked a bit the timeouts, retry settings in the Spark submit operator in Airflow to really make the connection between Airflow and our Spark cluster um, sturdy enough to really scale up uh, this, uh, these Spark jobs. And yeah, also we customized a bit the Spark operator operator themselves by making it a bit more flexible to inject a bit more parameters and widen the use case for it um, to, to be used uh, for our platform. 
Okay, uh, that, that's so far for the Spark Summit operator. Next topic is the um, scalability. And here I want to hand over to my colleague, uh, Anton. Anton, you're muted. Thanks, thanks, Philip. <laughs> Uh, so our next customization on the scalability and the resiliency of Airflow, uh, as uh, as Philip said, uh, this is very important for for us and uh, was uh, one of the main activities uh, that we did over the past two years. Uh, and uh, basically, to bring a single a single Airflow uh, instance uh, into a capability to process ten thousand tasks at at the time and to continuously improve it and um, this 10,000 uh, is basically the limit uh, that we had at, at the moment uh, and actually this uh, this slide is to show what are the main components that we, we will need to tweak and uh, um, to improve reaching base basically this goal of using 10,000 tasks and we will deep dive uh, into it uh, into the next slide. Um, the main part here is are basically um, that a good connection from Airflow to its main database and to its salary database is really crucial to scale up uh, to scale up Airflow, and uh, that's something that we improved. Uh, then the Airflow scheduler performance is also a crucial component, which is basically um, um, the core of, of Airflow, which we also tweak. Uh, and uh, then, then um, RabbitMQ uh, is also a, um, a critical component uh, here that basically serves to scale the salary nodes, which is necessary to scale up Airflow. And uh, then, then uh, also not only uh, the Airflow side, but also uh, the application side, the DAC side is very important. Uh, and uh, the architecture and, com and complexity of uh, DAX uh, playing a role um, in how far you can actually scale up um, scale up airflow. Um, so and uh, it's 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 time to to go um, um, to to the airflow and uh, and database connections. So we started uh, to use Airflow with uh, with direct direct connection to, to our database, which is uh, Postgres, Postgres, and uh, we recognize very soon that uh, if you want to scale out, basically uh, here uh, you reach the connection, the connections to the database, and uh, then Airflow breaks down and uh, to to basically uh, vanquish this, this this obstacle we have introduced pg bouncer as a pooling layer which basically enables us to serve a lot uh, of a lot of connections to the database from airflow um, whereas um, pg bouncer uh, directly has um, about one tenth uh, of the connections to the database um, so this make uh, makes it possible to uh, of, of many more connections to to the database. We have PG Bouncer running in uh, highly available uh, to be resilient uh, towards failures here, um, and uh, with that we we could uh, scale Airflow even more. Um, let's uh, so let's look at um, the tweaks of the database internal settings and. Um, uh, upgrade upgraded database continuously. Um, also, now we are working um, on the highly highly available database using Crunch database, and with that uh, setup, uh, we are uh, really able to uh, basically van vanquish uh, obstacle uh, that uh, does the database connections uh, are limiting limiting uh, airflow when you scale up. Um, also crucial here was the uh, to, to optimize uh, the SQL Alchemy package that comes with Airflow and which uh, basically not optimized um, also present a bottleneck. Um, and this is something that we particularly noticed and uh, something that we also tuned recently. Um, um, so for the RabbitMQ, uh, it's it's also important here because RabbitMQ basically uh, is the connection between Airflow and the salary nodes, uh, which is taking the actual work here. 
uh, so it's um, it's the message broker. Um, uh, so the first one of the things that uh, we realized is um, that when we scale scale out airflow, we need a lot of salary nodes. Uh, so we need to vertically scale um, the salary nodes, and we need to horizontally. Uh, scale them and for uh, horizontally scaling, creating more salary note, notes, uh, RabbitMQ really needs to be sturdy and really needs to be uh, equipped um, with the right settings and optimizations to basically have a good number of salary notes. Um, and this is something that we worked uh, on and uh, that we improved uh, over time. Uh, we've worked uh, quite a lot on RabbitMQ actually over the, the last two years. And also we, up, we upgraded uh, every queue um, in, in Airflow to be highly available. And also this is important because we don't want to, to have uh, jobs to be failed or jobs to be likely, uh, like basically swallowed or forgotten. Uh, if one of the RabbitMQ uh, nodes um, is is failing, um, so now we are um, at the very sturdy, highly available setup that uh, can serve enough, enough salary nodes and um, uh, really to 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 scale up airflow. Um, and the next um, the scheduler performance is um, also important topic. We realized uh, that the internal settings of the scheduler um, need to be optimized really in order to have the, um, the scheduler more um, fast enough uh, to, to process all the workloads. Also, multi-processing uh, capabilities of the scheduling uh, need to be leveraged and optimized and uh, the resource allocation of the for the scheduling uh, needs to be optimized. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's uh, also factors that we also worked on. Um, and um, important to notice um, that if the scheduler is basically more scheduler friendly uh, and therefore uh, more schedulable, uh, if you break up um, very, very complex structure and to load balance um, the work between different DAX, which are similar, uh, this also reduces the workload on the scheduler and enables uh, even more scalability on, on, on airflow. Um, and um, and of course, uh, there are also other um, adaptions that we worked on. Uh, we've mentioned uh, this Park Summit operator, which was a bottleneck uh, in the scalability. Um, we worked on the performance improvements uh, of the underlying um, of the underlying persistent storage for the um, our OpenShift containers that we use. Uh, we introduced uh, more fine-grained reduced allocation and very granulated therefore queuing setup. Uh, so basically basically one queue per duck, which um, enables really to scale up um, the different ducks uh, without interfering, interfering and uh, dead, deadlocking themselves. Also important uh, is the um, are the liveness and readiness probes um, of the containers to be optimized in order to to um, uh, if there is um, some failures due to the load to really have um, sturdier setup. Okay, this is about uh, about the scalability. Uh, let's go. Um, into the next topic, which is uh, the rolling upgrades. So basically, uh, we need to um, update therefore on the regular basis. We need to basically roll out um, our customiz customizations. We need to upgrade our setups. Uh, we need to tune the airflow queues. So all of the require uh, requires all, all that requires. Um, uh, basically, uh, to redeploy the airflow containers, but we have a regular load, uh, loads and uh, continuous uh, load running on airflow 24/7 actually. So the immediate con consequence here is um, that we need an upgrade redeployment method that without having any impact on the running jobs, uh, which uh, does not basically create service downtimes. The jobs must. Um, 
all finish gracefully during the, the upgrades and um, this also must be possible under under heavy loads uh, and therefore we created a helm chart for air for airfall to upgrade its uh, main components so um, these are um, um, so these are the core co components scheduler web servers workers and also the the rabbit mq uh, we are excluding the database here um, so we developed uh, rolling restart methods for all these components um, uh, for the containers by basically using the container settings uh, for light cycle hooks but also inbuilt um, airflow functions uh, like salary queue assignments and uh, to basically create this kind of uh, updates without business impact and uh, uh, and we have uh, displaying uh, displayed already um, this di diagram showing the different components um, so in green um, uh, means that it's basically a generation of um, containers uh, with the current setup, uh, the workers which are uh, highly available, web servers which are highly available, at, um, and uh, this is uh, a single instance of the scheduler. Then we triggered uh, the Helm upgrade. Uh, what happens is that, uh, let's focus on the workers for now. We basically spawn um, a new worker um, with, with new generation now showed uh, in, in blue. Uh, and then, the, and then the, the old worker is basically then going or migrating into a terminating state but uh, basically unassigned itself from the salary queue so so uh, it does not uh, accept any more traffic uh, but uh, using lifecycle hooks uh, it's uh, it's able to basically uh, finish all the work gracefully finish all the jobs running on it uh, even even if it's a long running uh, job um, then um, it's it's able to basically um, um yeah to finish his job um so um same is same is uh, with with the web server web servers because they are uh, also ha we can roll out a new generation of web servers with uh with updated code and configuration uh, and then this uh, enables um continuously new job uh, can be triggered on, on, on airflow and users can log in without any business impact even with um, running jobs and jobs being triggered and uh, then the scheduler is a single instance with therefore 110 uh, however it does not uh, really impact when we spawn a new generation of, uh, of the scheduler um, uh, the scheduler was uh, always able to finish the jobs and uh, schedule everything and this is basically not an issue uh, that the scheduler is um, not HA for this kind of uh, rolling upgrades so that's basically how the rolling upgrades uh, work uh, using helm featuring rolling uh, upgrades featuring uh, upgrades without any impact or uh, on any running jobs on airflow during any um, any upgrades of, of airflow uh, good and then let's go to the IAM solution um, so airflow is equipped with uh, inbuilt mechanism of authentication and authorization this is a very extensive setup however um, uh, and we we are dealing with a multi-tenant cluster where uh, different teams of users uh, different groups of users need to be handled uh, and uh, that's why we introduced basically a centralized IAM solution identity and access management solution which is a part of uh, our platform our platform uh, we integrated it uh, with with Airflow and with the source code that uh, basically whenever user ATAR trigger um, Airflow DAX by REST API or or login by the web UI Airflow we redirect we will redirect uh, uh, its authentication to uh, the IAM uh, and uh, where basically validate authentication 
uh, of the user using um, the exchange of, uh, of tokens. So our IAM solution um, uh, is token-based authentication using um, OAuth protocol. Uh, then we built this basically in custom into Airflow, which was not part of the Airflow source code by default. And uh, we've done this uh, uh, for the web interface. We also done this for the REST API, where uh, basically users can trigger Airflow DAX by REST API based on uh, on tokens which are before acquired uh, through the IAM instance. And also we introduced introduced an um, authorization layer so to basically allow the single users or given user can uh, can only trigger a given DAC or a given given set of DACs and uh, that's basically the part of our security concept for Airflow with uh, the IAM solution fully integrated. Um, next topic um, is the queue um, isolation of Airflow um, a fair fall. So in essence, what we did uh, is we arranged that we have um, one airflow queue per DAC or per small group of DACs. Uh, and this enables us to achieve a queue isolation. Uh, what does it mean? Um, it means that basically uh, each user on airflow and therefore each DAC and therefore each salary node uh, has only access to their own security tokens um, that are needed to access the um, to access other parts of the of the platform. Uh, it also means uh, that user can only trigger their own DACs and uh, can have access to their own DAC uh, code um, only. Also, it enables us to have a very very high grained uh, resource allocation, so to define. Uh, to define queue size and resources uh, in a given queue. And then this also for a um, given DAC, uh, so that uh, um, it, uh, if Airflow scale up, uh, that different DACs basically don't destructively interfere um, um, interfere with uh, with each other, meaning basically to lock each other for a given capacity of uh, the whole airflow instance. Uh, and um, we have uh, this diagram on right. Uh, so uh, to basically um, display this kind of setup. Um, so um, on the user level, we have different users which are only allowed uh, to basically trigger their um, own DACs. Um, um, and um, the DACs uh, that they own uh, and given DAC is um, only mounted um, on the given salary queue. And this salary queue uh, corresponds to a given set of salary nodes that have uh, in turn, then access to their uh, own resources and uh, their own secrets. So this is uh, kind of uh, then isolated uh, from from user level to a DAG level to Q level, and uh, then also to a secret level and uh, a node level. So that's about the the Q Q isolation mechanism that we have. Um, and um, other part of um, last airflow custom customization that we want to mention uh, is um, the login framework. Uh, and uh, this has to turn uh, out very us useful because airflow logs and uh, and I mean that the airflow, uh, the, I mean uh, airflow task uh, works that you can access via the, um, the web interface are really crucial uh, to troubleshoot problems, uh, to, to understand the nature of uh, tasks and uh, what, uh, we, what we have done uh, for, um, uh, for the adoption of the airflow working, working internal mechanism is that uh, we have basically uh, changed the format of the airflow task works uh, to be JSON compatible. So so that they can be uh, automatically scraped by uh, Elasticsearch and can be 
then visible in tools like uh, Kibana and this JSON compatible works in Airflow. They admittedly uh, not in the in the prettiest um, in the in the prettiest shape. Uh, so um, so uh, that make it um, harder to read uh, for for users users uh, in 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 Airflow. Uh, so that's why we we have currently working uh, process to still keep the old format of walks uh, in Airflow, which are very uh, user friendly, but in parallel to basically be scrapable by Kibana and uh, to be JSON compatible uh, on the other side. Uh, we also adapted the Airflow internal logging mechanism based, uh, based on the source code to enable, enable us to define additional logging fields. So basically to inject different information uh, of different uh, diagrams uh, that are basically injected at uh, runtime. So if you trigger uh, a DAC, you can insert uh, different information about the particular diagram. Uh, which uh, will then be displayed uh, in the in the airflow walks. This is very useful to have uh, more informa information about different diagrams uh, when they are triggered um, automatically uh, by other pipelines. Um, and last but uh, last but not least, uh, we already mentioned um, that when talking about Spark submit operator, we changed the Spark submit operator so. Uh, that we can have um, the application logs and uh, that are generated uh, in Yarn by Spark to be transported uh, and to and visible in Airflow, which is very useful for the bugging problem for the bugging problems that are uh, appearing in Yarn. Uh, then that are uh, then visible in visible in Airflow. And uh, okay, that's about the working format. Uh, and uh, here I want to give um, the word back to Philip. Okay, I hope uh, I'm uh, audible now. Um, if you go one slide, sorry. Let's go right to the end. All right, so we want to wrap up um, the presentation by showing what we anticipated um, to uh, do as uh, further steps to improve airflow. So um, they're listed here. So going from left to right here, this is about um, reworking. I mean, we, we are now working on implementing an HA solution for our database. This will be very useful to um, when we um, update the database that we also include uh, that we also have a minimal impact on airflow so we'd like to um, when we switch to the airflow ha uh, sorry for the database ha solution that we also include this in our rolling updates so that we have really a minimal impact even when updating the database which is not yet possible then we are working on upgrading to airflow 2 obviously this is um, yeah we are very, we are very i mean we are aware that airflow 2 comes with a lot of different improvements and um, we, we are working on a, a yeah, proof of concept to bring this onto a platform to really evaluate um, uh, how much effort it would be to, to bring it here and, um, what, um, and how this exactly would work out. And then also we are working to integrate um, the Airflow uh, services offered by, the, by Red Hat, by the Open Data Hub. This, these are uh, lightweight Airflow instances that are very easy to spin up by end users. This would um, then introduce um, yeah, sort of horizontal scalability to our setup. Um, we are now using very few instances which are heavily scaled and that would offer the possibility to yeah, explore a little bit more to distribute the work and to do some more development of, of work in, in wider spread, in a wider spread setup with more lightweight airflow instances. And last but not least, we are continuously updating the um, security of airflow um, which um, yeah is uh, really needed for a multi-tenant platform, and that's all. Um